Hello folks, I wanted to bring you something fun today and we're going to be doing a speed run of the entire XState documentation using the new features of the Stately Editor and Stately VS Code. Uh, we're going to be building a little app which we may reference or we may not and we're going to go through each page of the documentation pretty quickly and see how the editor can make it a little bit easier to understand. We've got the visual editor here and I'll just open this up now and I'll make my face a little bit smaller I think too. I've installed the VS Code extension, which is available here, XState VS Code, and I'm going to open the Visual Editor. Here you can see that I've just got a simple machine and I can add states to it and transitions between them, but we'll get into what all of that means in a second. But the important thing is that you have this screen open and you have a machine created from XState here. I've also installed XState and I've also got XState React installed as well, but you don't need to pay too much attention about the React bit. So, Let's get started and let's go from the first page of the documentation. I'm going to start from getting started. We've run npm install xstate and there you can import a machine and create a machine. And here, as you can see, we have this promise machine, create machine, blah, 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 blah. And what these individual states are, we'll get to in a second. But let's just copy and paste this code and see what it looks like. So we've got const machine inside here. And as you can see, there's a promise, rejected, pending, and resolved. Now, let's have a look at what these states mean. We can now go to the Introduction to State Machines and State Charts, which is a brilliant article that Laura on our team has written. And we have states here. The states are represented by rounded rectangle boxes. So yeah, to draw a state chart for a process of a dog, there are two states that come to mind, asleep and awake. So you can think of states as kind of like ways that your app can behave or ways that your process can behave. They're kind of like moments in time where different behaviors are exhibited. So you've got asleep, awake, eating, for instance, um, walking, running, all that sort of stuff. Anything that you want to model in the process of building your thing, you can kind of do that with states. So let's add a, um, a sleep state for our dog and an awake state. And then let's follow through the article as it goes. And we'll call this a dog there. And I'm, what I'm doing there is I'm just double clicking to access the names of things. And as you can see, it's updating in the left hand side too. Okay, transitions and events. Yeah, okay, so this is how you move between states is really important. So how the dog goes between sleep and awake is through transitions. And here, when the dog receives the wake up event, like when something triggers the wake up, then it turns into awake. And this could actually go through in any number of ways then. So as you saw what I did there, if I slow that down, I'll delete this and I can click and drag from here to here and that creates a transition. So when the dog's asleep, like anything can wake it up, you know, like a loud noise, for instance. So loud noise and the dog is awake. Uh, could be a different one. So it could be, let's click and drag again, could be uh, smells food and then suddenly it's awake. So you can have more than one transition uh, of a different sort to this thing. Um, and then when it gets sleepy, or rather uh, falls asleep, then there you go, we can transition back there. We can also simulate this behavior in the editor by pressing simulate, and now you can just click through. So there you go, falls asleep, loud noise and it's awake. There you go, so that poor dog is not getting much rest. So transitions and events, that makes sense. The initial state is really important. Every machine here that you create has to have an initial state. And for us, it's the asleep state. I can change this to be awake there. And now the dog starts in the awake state, which I guess is, is sort of true. You know, when you're born, are you awake or asleep? That's quite a deep question, isn't it? And some processes will have a final state as well. So this is sort of a bit sad. Like, we don't want to think our, of our dog as having a final state. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a, a terrible solution. So let's make a new machine, const machine equals create machine. Uh, and we can inside here open the visual editor and let's imagine now that our process is a um, let's use the one from the article where you're going for a walk uh, you which state do we start on yeah waiting to leave home so now you're sort of waiting and then I can just click and drag to create a new event and a state so you waiting then you leave home uh, leave home and then you're on a walk and then when you get back home uh, you're tired and the walk is ended so get back home and you're tired and you just sort of 
uh, let's say walk ended. And there, the way you can turn that into a final state is you can go over here into the uh, state itself and you can give it a type of final. And that means that the walk process now has a beginning and an end. This is useful for things like promises, for things like things that you know have a start and an end. A user interface doesn't really have a start and an end, but certain processes within the user interface might. You know. uh, so there we go. Now compound states. So this is when you you can have states within states, where, for instance, if we go back to our previous example up here, um, when you're awake, like that's not just one state. You know, like you could be awake and something else. So you could be awake and uh, sleepy, even. You could be awake and um, kind of energetic. So one way to think of this is you could even kind of have like when you have uh, when you're asleep and you wake up and you're there's a loud noise you might actually be energetic and we can even rename that to scared so you're awake and scared when you hear that loud noise and for instance too if I just sort out the way this looks when you smell the food there you can see by the way I can click on the transition here and just click and drag and move this over then you're awake but you're still sleepy it's, oh. Oh, please, I just want to go. And you can even go from sleepy to scared if you want to within here, where you would say, uh, let's say, um, uh, well, even here, loud noise would work too. So loud noise. Oh God, suddenly I'm scared. So if we, um, yeah, we we are awake. Oh, there we go. We our default state is sleepy, which is kind of interesting. Our initial state is sleepy, which I think makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess. Well, I guess we'll, we'll we can model that differently as we go. Let's imagine that sleep is our um, is our initial state, and when we simulate, then we smell the food and we're sleepy, and then we have a loud noise and then we're scared. Makes sense. Okay, so we got compound states. They're very very powerful. We can um, do all sorts of things with them. And an atomic state, um, an atomic state is basically a state that doesn't have any children. So you have states with children and states without them. This is a compound state, this is a wake one, and this one is a, an atomic state. Although we could have like a sleep and dreaming or a sleep in REM sleep, a sleep in deep sleep, uh, a sleep and pretending, you know, like all sorts of stuff. Um, you can also use parallel states here. A parallel state is when you have a uh, like a compound state and it's got multiple things going on at the same time. So if we create a new machine, let's go const machine equals create machine. I'm just going to pause the video while I do this. So here I've just created a machine called a call machine. And this call machine, what it's going to do is it's going to manage your microphone and your video while you're on a call. And we're going to call this, a, this is going to be a parallel state node. So type of parallel, parallel, there we go. And when we do that, everything beneath it becomes um, in fact, we don't we don't need the initial state here because actually um, parallel state nodes don't have initial states. All of the things within them start at the same time. So this one I'm going to call the microphone states, and this one is going to be the um, video state. And with the microphone, like you might start muted, for instance, if you go into a Zoom call, and I'm going to click and drag this, and it's going to stay within the box here. I'm just going to pull it out a little bit. And when you unmute, you're going to go to the unmuted state. And we're going to head back up here and go back to muted via the mute event. Same thing in the video. We're going to add another um, another state in here. And this is going to be um, like showing video so or sharing video. So you start um, when you join this conference call, you're showing your video, but you're also muted. So let's go in here as well. Whoops, I clicked outside. So there we go. Um, so you're showing your video and then hiding your video, for instance. So let's do that here. Uh, show a high video and then back to here. And then as you can see, if we go show video, then we can simulate this and you can see that both processes run at the same time. So here our microphone is muted and our video is showing. If we unmute, then that's running. And so both of these processes can work independently of the other. So those are parallel states. So next up, um, we have something called a self-transition. It's when an event happens, but it returns to its same state. And this is useful for when you like, um, 
let's say, let me think of an example a second. Yeah, the example in the docs is brilliant, which is the dog uh, gets a treat, but it doesn't uh, doesn't change its behavior at all. It's going to keep begging for it. Uh, so I'm going to create a state machine that looks like that. Okay, we've got our begging states here. I'm going to make the uh, awake state the defaults, or the initial state, I should say. Uh, the awake is the initial state, and the begging is going to be the initial state of awake, because, you know, what dog doesn't always beg? The way you can create a self transition is you can go from like this, click and drag and drag it to the self. There you go. And so it um, adds it there. So when you give it a treat, uh, give treat, it's still going to be begging. It doesn't matter what happens. So self transitions, you might think sort of what's the point of that? Because if I click give treat, it's not going to do anything. Well, they'll become useful later and we will uh, dive into why they're useful. So yeah, let's see. Planning state chat for a longer machine, delay transitions. We might get to these later. Yeah, here's a good one. Actions. So actions, uh, this will contextualize what makes a, um, a self-transition useful. A self-transition, what you can do is you can perform kind of like random actions whenever you um, like take a transition, for instance. So here, um, let me think. Uh, let me check the docs to see what example they have. Yeah, here we go. Entry warn user about auto logout. So this is very cool. What what we're going to do um, with our call machine here, if I open the visual editor, is like our call machine at the moment, when you simulate it, doesn't, doesn't do anything. You know, it's just sort of moving between the states and you can use it to sort of drive a UI, for instance. Um, like, for instance, if the state machine receives the mute event, then it will move to a different state. And in fact, just to illustrate that, let me pump that into a UI and let's show you what that does. Okay, we've now got our um, our user interface running off the machine two, which is what I called the uh, the call machine. And you can see that when you access this state, it's got some values in it. So it's got microphone is muted and video is showing video. So if I unmute, then it goes into the unmuted state. If I hide the video, there you go. It's hiding the video and the microphone is unmuted. So all of these are, even though they're sort of swapping for some reason, they're independent of each other. Now actions, what you can do is when you have an action, you can fire it at certain points and an action is essentially just do something. And it's a specific type of do something where you don't care about the outcome of the thing. And I'll go into what that means in a second. But really what we can do is when, for instance, we enter the, uh, or when we mute, for example, we don't just want to move into the state. We actually want to mute the user's microphone. We actually want to do the thing. So you can go onto the mute event here and you can say actions and you can say uh, mute microphone. And when we save that, you can see that there's mute microphone appears there. And you can also do the same here. So actions, oops, not activities, uh, unmute microphone. And we'll save that. So we got our mute and unmute. And those actions now, we can actually implement them and just get them to run arbitrary code when we do it. So we can say uh, inside our machine up here, for instance, and actually what I'm gonna do is in order to get some really good TypeScript with this, I'm just gonna run TS types or add TS types there, and save the file. And this, I'm not gonna to go too much into what this goes into, but it basically means we get really, really nice uh, TypeScript here. So we get our actions and we got mute microphone and unmute microphone. When we mute the microphone, I'm going to alert that microphone is muted. And when we unmute the microphone, we're going to alert that uh, microphone is unmuted. So we'll save that and then we can go back in here. And you've got to refresh the page with X8, so we haven't got hot reloading working perfectly. And when we unmute, you can see that it says microphone is unmuted. Mute again, microphone is muted. So actions are a really, really good way to just run arbitrary bits of code whenever you need to. You can run uh, actions on transitions here, as we're doing here, so you can see it appears there. Or if we remove that, if I go into the action there, you can actually also do actions when you enter a state too, or when you exit it. So we can say entry on muted. Uh, what we want to do is unmute microphone and save. And we want to do the same thing on the muted state or the opposite thing where we have entry, mute microphone. And you can see there 
that when we enter the muted state, whenever we enter it from anywhere for any reason, or even when we start um, in the muted state, it's going to run that. So if we save that now and go back into here, all our actions will work in the same way. And we refresh the page, then it should alert me because I've just entered the microphone is muted state. There we go. We can enter the unmuted state and we say the microphone is unmuted. It's really cool because it means that we can shift these actions around anywhere and still they have the same implementation here. Let's find one more way to do it, which is when we're in the muted state. Uh, let's see, when we enter, we want to mute the microphone. But when we exit, we actually want to unmute the microphone. So we can actually remove this one because uh, otherwise we're doing our work twice. And that means it's really, really clear what's happening. When you enter, you mute. When you exit, you unmute. And we save that and it will have exactly the same behavior. There we go. When we leave, unmute, mute, etc. So re actions are really, really clever. And I think that covers, yeah, that covers kind of the first steps of this article. Okay, speed run first step complete, very nice. Let's get, go down into the machines. We've kind of run through a lot of this stuff. Uh, you can see that the ID of the machine, it's kind of just this ID that we have here. So the ID call machine. If I update this up here, then we have a phone call machine, then the ID will update there too. Uh, initial we've covered, okay, context we haven't covered yet. Uh, let's see, is context down there? No, it isn't. Um, We'll get to context a bit later because I want to talk talk about that in a separate way. Uh, we have talked about options though. As you can see, there are these things called actions, activities, delays, guards, services. And actions is the one that we've seen so far. Uh, when we were in our app.tsx, when we used our machine from React, then we passed in the options that were needed here. But we could take these and move them somewhere else. We could actually move them to the machine itself. This create machine call here, you can pass it a second property where you can actually just throw in the actions there. So we can throw in the actions. And we've got our mute microphone and unmute microphone there. And this should, yeah, stop erroring because we've passed them there. So that's a good way if you want to co-locate your side effects with your logic, then you can just put them in, in the second property there. Whereas if you need access to like runtime variables or things within the React closure, for instance, like we have here, then you might need to put them as the second argument. And of course, what I can do is I can override them if I need to. So if I want to say mute microphone is actually going to alert, wow, like this, then it's going to ignore the implementation there and it's going to use this one instead. And we can test that where we can say, uh, let's say refresh the page, wow, there we go. You get the idea. So you can pass them in the second argument there. You can also, if you want to, you can use with config too, where you can say, here's my machine, and I can pass with config and just pass the actions in like that. That's just another way of overriding it um, like that. Okie dokie, uh, there we go. Extending machines with config, you get the idea. So again, we'll talk about context in a second. Uh, initial context, okay, and we've got states now. So states are an abstract representation of a system. Yeah, we've kind of covered this. They're the way that you can express all the hierarchy of your system, all that kind of thing. Mm. Okay, so you're gonna see some stuff about light machine dot transition in the docs. Uh, mostly dot transition is not uh, very useful. It's not used in all sorts of stuff, but it's, it is interesting as a way of creating like a pure function. So what you can do is for instance, in your app, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run some code in a use effect and I'm just going to set that up for a second. Okay, so what I've done is I've added a use effect here which is going to run a function called console log transition. And as you can see, we have a machine two dot transition and we transition from the initial state and we pass it the mute event. This can also be expressed like this with a type of mute. So what we should see is when we open our application, you should see console log new state dot value new state dot context. And what dot transition does is it takes this state machine that we have here and it returns a new state as a pure function. So when we go into our console here, <laughs> God, these alerts are getting a bit annoying. I'll just disable them. Okay, we should be able to see inside our console and the result of something. So we've got object undefined, and I'm just gonna zoom this in so you can see properly. Um, 
we can see that we have microphone muted and showing video. This is despite the fact that our initial state is actually, oh yeah, actually we should be calling unmute there instead of mute. So let's do that. Because the mute, it doesn't do anything at the moment. So when we unmute, then our new state should be microphone unmuted and video showing video. So that's the idea of machine.transition. You can also look at the actions that were fired, for instance, too. So new state dot actions, which is often really useful if you're in a context other than the front end. And as you can see, there's actions in here in the third parameter of what console logged, where it says to unmute the microphone. So it's very, very useful, and it means that you can um, run your machines in a pure way if that's what you need. And a lot of our docs refer to dot transition, even though it's not used all that much. Let's carry on with our, our docs here. And yeah, as you can see, we're exploring this kind of state attribute that we get from new state. So some things that you have here are like new state dot value, new state dot context, and new state dot actions. And you've also got things like state dot matches, which state dot matches is really, really useful. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to go like new states or if new state dot matches and then microphone dot muted or video dot hiding video. Let's go with microphone dot unmuted because that's what we're getting. And then we can console log. Wow. Loving all the wows today. And then what we should see is, yeah, we get our wow here. And this is because we match here. And this is a very, very useful function, and it's uh, it's going to come in handy in a lot of contexts. So we've got state.matches. We've also got state.nextEvents. This is when you can look at uh, what events the the state will accept. So you can say console log new state on next events. Let's take a look at the console. And here you can have two events. They're the, just the strings of the events and you have mute and hide video. And what we've got here is I'm actually using this in the React application that we have. I remember this is uh, not the current running machine that we have. It's just a sort of dummy one up here. Um, and inside the React app, if I just console, or if I just comment this out for brevity. I'm running state.nextevents.map and I'm creating a button which sends the event to the running machine. So what we have here is you can unmute, mute, unmute, mute. And those next events that we're seeing here, they're just pulled directly from the state machine. So the state machine is able to tell you what it's able to receive, which opens up some really cool um, sort of possibilities for your UI too. And actually, it also allows you to do things like this, where you can have a property, and I'm gonna just pull this back here. There's a property here called can. So new state dot can, and we can check if uh, we can mute. So if we check if we can mute, and then console log this, then we can see it's true, because we're uh, in this version here, because we've just unmuted, we're in the muted state. So let me actually pull this into the uh, Dom just here. I'm going to say console log state dot can uh, mute, and you're going to see it's false first because we're in the muted state, so we can't mute while we're unmuted. That wouldn't do anything. Then you can unmute, and it becomes true. Mute, 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 and hide video as well. That's not going to make any difference because you know the the video is disconnected from the muting. So state dot can is very very useful too. We can look at state.changed, uh, state.done, state.toString, state.children. We're going to look at state.children in a bit, um, but in the sort of idea of speed running this, I'm going to skip out on those because dot change, dot final, like, okay, in fact, let me just give a brief description of each of them. So state.changed is when you've changed from the previous state. Either you've run some actions or you've just moved to a new state. State.done is when you've entered a final state of the state machine. So for instance, when we had our walking state up here, uh, so promise machine dog was asleep, yeah, this one, uh, this would be the walk machine itself would enter, would be done when you reach the walk ended state. So you get to here and then uh, dot done becomes true. Then you have state.toStrings, I don't think that matters. State.children, uh, we'll get to that later. State dot has tag. This is a pretty cool feature. Um, it allows you to tag certain states, um, and then kind of like read the tags later. So you can actually add, for instance, in this muting thing, 
if I just close the editor for this actually, uh, you can add inside, for instance, microphone muted, you can say tags and then like show red microphone symbol. And then the tags in the unmuted would be show green microphone symbol. So this allows you to show, kind of give direct instructions to your API uh, or to your UI. And you can say console log state dot has tag. And then you get the type safe um, attributes from there too. So show green microphone symbol or show red. Two seconds, my cat is going crazy. Okay, next up after tags, then we have this uh, state metadata. Um, we could talk about persisting states, but I'm not going to because it's not um, sort of fully complete at the moment. Uh, yeah, this this could be improved later, I think. So state metadata. This is metadata that you can attach to each state, and it can be like things like message, uh, meta alert, all that sort of thing. And you can then access this in various um, parts of your app, uh, and you can also access it at state meta here. I'm again not going to talk about this because it's sort of like a, a side benefit. I've never actually used meta in production uh, with XState, so it's sort of um, like there are things it's useful for and things that it's not useful for, but in the spirit of the speed run, I'm just going to keep on rolling through. Okay, we're done with states, so state nodes. So let's see here. Uh, as you can see, state nodes are all state a machine could be in. This is pretty similar to all the other stuff that we have. Yeah, we know about atomic, compound, parallel, final, and, and we don't know about history state nodes. Uh, and I'm going to skip over those as well. Or um, we may get to them later. But I, I rarely find uh, um, a use for history nodes. What I do find useful all the time, though, are transient state nodes. So transient state nodes are a way to make choices in your UI. And this sort of brings us, uh, yeah, this, this is such a useful feature of state charts. What it allows you to do is it allows you to, if we have, and I'm going to think of an example two seconds. I thought about this for a minute and I'm actually going to go in a different order here because transient state nodes make more sense when you understand context. Now context is a way of adding kind of like arbitrary states, arbitrary stuff, data kind of into your state machine as storage. And we're going to do, we're going to take this uh, counter example. So this is kind of interesting. Glass is full, add water, all this sort of stuff. Does this make sense? I mean, there's like a transient transition there. I'm going to make my own one. Uh, let's make a counter. So we're going to go const counter equals create machine. And let's open the visual editor again. We can give it an ID of counter. I don't know why we've ended up in an invalid state there. And let's go counter. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, we're just going to have two states where we're going to have like on and off. And actually, I'm going to call this like a toggle. So let's say we've got this toggle here, and it's toggle on and off. And I'm going to toggle between it just with a toggle event. So we have toggle. And then this one here is going to go for toggle as well. Oops, I put that in the wrong spot. Uh, I'm just undoing, by the way, as I'm going. So click and drag over here, toggle. And now, as you see, when you simulate it, you can toggle it on and off by sending the toggle event over and over. But every time we uh, toggle, I would like to keep track of how many times we've toggled. And in order to do that, we're going to need to have the number, which is like the count of how many times we've toggled. So inside here, I'm going to add context. I'm going to say the count is zero. And every time we increment this, every time we toggle, what we're going to do is increment the amount, the count, basically. So we can do this as an action. We can say um, every time the toggle event is fired, we're going to say increment toggle and add that there and the same thing here too. So we've got increment toggle on both of them. Now we're going to add this in here. So actions, we have increment toggle, or in fact we should do, but I haven't added uh, TS types here yet. So now we're going to have the nice autocomplete increment toggle. And for this, we're going to use an assign action. So an assign action, is an action that we get from xState itself. And a sign is going to come from in there. Now, a sign, if we grab it from here, yeah, you can see it's here. The assign action, um, as you can see, 
it sort of takes in an object or a function and it basically takes in instructions for how to update the context based on the events that have been fired. So yeah, we can like assign to all sorts of ways. Um, let's use this syntax. And in fact, there we go. We've got uh, something already there that's gonna be very useful for us. So I'm gonna copy and paste that. We've got our counter here. Where did our counter go? So I'll just search for toggle in the dock. And there we go, increment toggle. I'm gonna paste that in there and that assign is going to go there. So, okay, we've got our increment toggle and this message isn't required and we're gonna take that away there. So each, as you can see, um, we can add kind of different elements into our assign function here. And it's basically a way to um, sort of show X state how we want to update our state. So we've got context plus count uh, there and we have access to either the context or the event that fired it and if we console log the event here it's going to come up with um, type toggle so it's going to look like this it's going to look like uh, type toggle basically um, which isn't very useful for us now like uh, all we need really is to know that know what the context is so we can plus one it so we're going to return context uh, dot count plus one and what that's going to do is I'm now going to pull that counter machine into our UI two seconds so I just imported counter machine here and when I go to my app here I'm going to refresh the page and you can see the context now has a value and it's been toggled zero times and as I toggle on off on off on off on off on off it's going to go up and up and up so that's how we inc like implement kind of uh, arbitrary changes to our context and you can do any you can do assigning within any action so with an entry action or a um, exit action or a whatever you like uh, if we want to we can just have it every time we enter the state off we can increment toggle and the same when we exit as well do that same trick we did earlier exit uh, we don't need this action anymore so now it's both on those entry and exit and now it should behave in the same way because we're leaving um, leaving and entering off a bunch of times so there's that um, and that's essentially how context works in two seconds I'm just going to take a drink okay now that we've got context figured out we can see a bit more why always transitions are useful and the reason they're useful I think they're on state nodes uh, like transient state nodes or something that's where we got up to um, what you can do is you can have a state which is basically like a choice state where when you go to that state you can instantly make a decision and that's why it's called a transient node because you go straight through it and what we're going to do is we're actually going to have a um, uh, we're going to have this kind of check on the root of our node so we can say um, always the way we want this to work is we want to say, um, and in fact, we can do this uh, from this screen here. We can say always whenever we are in this state and basically we want to disable the toggle after a certain time. So we're going to add a new state called disabled and we just zoom out a little bit and I'm going to click here and just drag from the outside in and this is going to create a state or an event that can be fired at any time. So if I change this to like disable here, then we can simulate this and we can say toggle on and off, toggle on and off, and this is happening all by itself. But when you disable, then you can't toggle anymore. And this can't ever be re-enabled actually. So we've got our disabled state there, but we don't want this to happen on an event. We actually want to check if the count is more than five. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to open this tab in the right-hand panel here, and we're gonna change this from an event into an always and the always there what it's going to do currently it's going to always go to the disabled state so we can't throw any toggled events there because we're just always going to go there and always happens instantly so if we were to use this in our app here what we would do is we would just get a kind of um like it would just sort of would burn out basically so it would always go to the to the disabled state which is no good so we actually want to say always if go to this disabled state and our condition is going to be if the 
count is greater than five. So I'm going to say if count greater than five, go to the disabled state. So this means that whatever state we're in inside our state chart, we can simulate this, toggle up, toggle up, toggle up. If the count gets greater than five at any time, go to the disabled state. Very, very useful. What we do need to do though is this description isn't enough to go on for our state chart, so we're going to add, need to add a guard. We're going to say if the count is greater than five, um, in here we gain access to the context and to event inside there, and we're just going to say return context dot count is greater than five. So they're a bit hard to wrap your mind around basically, but this this guard will run on every single event that's fired. And we'll just check, 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 check. And then when it happens, it will go in. So let's see that working. We can go to our VTAP here, refresh the page. And oh yeah, we've got this little uh, next event there, but you can ignore that for now. So I toggle, I toggle, I toggle, I toggle, I toggle. And then when I get to this one, it's gonna go into the disable state. Ooh, maximum call stack excited. I wonder why that is. I'm gonna figure that out. I think I've actually modeled this incorrectly. The way that I've done this is it means that uh, this always will kind of just work infinitely. So it means that when you when you are in this state and then you then go to the disabled state, the maximum call stack size exceeded error means that we're always, 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 always taking that transition. So it's like a for loop that's gone infinite because it always uh, checks based on the last state you were in. And if you've moved to a new state, then it sort of does its thing and it checks again. So what it's doing is it's checking, 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 which is not particularly good. So ideally what we want to do is we want to have an always that runs when we're in either the on or the off state. And there are two ways that we could go about this. We could create a state where it's enabled and this is going to be the default state. So I'm going to um, go up into here and change enabled to there. And then what I'm going to do is just add all of this stuff in there into the enabled. Copy and paste is there's currently a bug where you can't copy and paste inside here. So I can try, but no, it ain't going to work. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take all of this stuff, the on and the off, and I'm just going to add it to the enabled state here. So inside states, on, there we go. And then we're going to have an initial, which is on. And that should work. Uh, the toggle dot off is not going to be correct anymore. So this is going to be toggle dot enabled dot off. There we go. And so it got a little bit uglier there because it needed to um, sort of auto layout itself again. And but you can see it's still the, exactly the same state chart. So we've got our enabled on and off here. And now what we can do is when we're in the enabled state, if the count is greater than five, then we go to the disabled state. And that's how it's going to work. So you can see here that we start in enabled if we simulate, toggle on, toggle off, toggle on, toggle off. And when the count is greater than five, then we go to the disabled state. And that should work a little bit better. So when we try here, we toggle, 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 toggle. And now we're in the disabled state. The other alternative way to do it, if we wanted to, is uh, we could take out all of those states and we could um, basically make two transitions. So two checks based on whether we were on or off we could then go into the disabled state. So let me set that up for you now to just see what that looks like. So here you go, this is kind of what this looks like. Um, we've now got two always transitions uh, coming off the on and the off, and they both go into disabled. So it has the same behavior where you can have toggle, 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 toggle. And depending on which one you're on, if the count is greater than five, we're gonna to go to the disabled state. If we have a look at that, it should behave in exactly the same way, actually. So for instance, some reason toggle isn't on, uh, let me check there, two seconds. Ah, it's because I hadn't saved my machine, there we go. So when I toggle, 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 and then one more toggle and I should go to the disabled state. There we go. So there are often multiple ways that you can model your machine. You know, I, I did it in two different ways there and it just depends on what your constraints are and what you prefer but both of them resulted in exactly the same behavior, which is interesting. That's gonna come up a lot, I think. So we've now got our transient state notes. We understand that there's always thing here. And this is cool because you can actually express more than one uh, kind of guard uh, in here. So you can say like, um, let's imagine that we create a parallel state to this, or 
maybe there's a different way that we can express this, but two seconds. Okay, we're going to use an authentication machine for this where we're checking the user's permission level. And we're going to wait for like permissions details received. And we can check that the user is either an admin or a, uh, so they might be an admin. They could be a kind of a normal user. So we'll just say normal, or they could be, uh, they could have no permission here. And we need to somehow work out which one is which, and we need to go from place to place here. So we need to, if they're an admin, go here. So the way that we express that is we can add a condition here. So we can say, if user is admin, then we go to admin. Otherwise, we can add another condition here. I'm just going to drag these away. Uh, else, we should go to normal. But actually, we have a third condition. So we're going to need to make this an else if. So it is else if user is normal, then go here. Otherwise, the user doesn't have any permissions. And so we go to the no permissions state. So there, as you can see, it's sort of printed out this first is the user an admin, then is the user normal, and then we go here. So it's basically if else if logic. You can even fire actions based on these conditions too. So you can say, uh, I'm going to add it into here. You can say actions. Uh, you can express actions as an array, by the way, so you can express more than one. Uh, we can say, uh, say hello to normal user. And then we can even like report to API that normal user logged in. You get the idea. So there's, there's this weird bug here where it's sort of, um, I don't think it's our fault. I think it's like a rendering error in Chromium or something where if you intersect it, it just looks weird. So uh, we're on it. Uh, so yeah, you get the idea. We come from checking user permissions level and we can either go to user is admin here or user is normal or else no permission. So that's the idea of this. And it means that you can do these, uh, you can actually do these conditions on any state. So you see this one isn't an always, we can express it as an always, but actually on any event, you can do if else logic uh, till the cows come home. That's such a British phrase, but you can do these kind of like um, array of transitions. So that means after an always, after an event, and in a few minutes, I'm gonna show you another place you can do them too. So we've got our state node metadata to state node IDs. We've got our tags. Okay, we've covered those already. We've got our events. Um, yeah, you can send events. This is using the transition thing here. Um, oh yeah, interpret is worth talking about. Interpret is a method for um, kind of turning your machine into something that's running. And when you interpret a machine, what you do is you basically say, okay, you can start running and you can now start receiving events. We're doing that in a fashion with our um, use machine hook here. Use machine basically does the same thing. Um, there's even a version of use machine called use interpret. Use interpret. Where what you do is it actually returns a service instead of this um, tuple here. So this service is the same thing that you would get if you just ran uh, const uh, service equals interpret uh, machine two, for instance, and you've got to start it as well. Um, interpreting machines is useful in, in certain contexts. It's very, very useful in uh, node in the back end, and it allows you to just sort of monitor. So you can like uh, check that on transition or on change or subscribe to it. There's all sorts of methods that I'm not going to go into for this speed run because I'm sort of like focusing on the kind of front endy things or front endy uh, reacty stuff. So yeah, for now you can think of use machine as very similar or interpret as very similar to what we have with use machine, where here all that's different is that react is subscribing to the updates so that react can understand what's going on inside your machine. So that's what um, uh, interpret is about. Next up, we have null events. Oh yeah, we've got, uh, this is kind of the same thing as these always transitions. Uh, null events, okay, transitions onto here. Yeah, we've talked about this before where you have, um, you don't really need to care about the, the syntax uh, with the visual editor because it sort of takes care of it for you. And yeah, we've got these events which are very similar to, or exactly the same as all of the events that we've declared in here. So you can see that there's an on toggle and you target this element here. Uh, machine.transition we've talked about, enable transitions, 
Yeah, um, like so. Cert like one really key thing to do with state charts is that you can only take certain transitions when you're in certain states. This muted one is a great example where, like, uh, when you're in here, you can only send the unmute event. You can send as many mute events as you like. It won't error, but it won't do anything. And that's a that's a really good guarantee for um, when you're building a UI because you know that your logic is sound no matter what's going on. So that all makes sense. Click is the event. I don't understand this really. Null event descriptors. Oh yeah. So there's there's a different type of event called a wildcard event, and a wildcard event um, basically responds to any event that's sent to the or wildcard transition. Um, responds to any events that's sent to the machine itself. So what I can do here is I can actually say, um, let's add a third um, third thing here, which is going to be just a wildcard area. And what we're going to do is on a wildcard, uh, I'm going to keep these states sort of, uh, maybe I'll call them foo and bar. Foo and bar. And Whenever anything happens, we're going to transition between foo and bar. And the way we do this is we can uh, go into the top here and we can describe it as a wildcard event. And you can see then it gets, uh, oh, wildcards aren't being printed. That's that's pretty bad actually, but there's a bug there. Um, and I'm going to, in fact, I'm just gonna write that bug down. Okay, um, I've written that bug down, but the idea here is that you should get this kind of like Thing like this, so I can change them to this, and this should work. Yeah, here we go. Oh, look how beautiful that auto layout worked. Very nice. So now, when I simulate this, you can see that whatever event I click, in theory, this should move between them. So I think there's a bug here too with these wildcard events. But if I use this in code, it will work. Which is, if I go to, oh dear. Okay, things breaking left and right. But when I actually implement this in code, you'll see that it does shift between foo and bar. I'm just going to close the visual editor, go to the app, and then we're not in the counter machine. We want the machine two, I think. And we're going to save this and then head into this. And you can see that there's this wildcard area. And now whenever I mute or unmute, it flicks between foo and bar. And that's because it's listening for every event. Okay, so that's the wildcard event. We've done self transitions. Um, internal transitions are useful in some contexts. So an internal transition it basically, um, the way to think about this is it's useful for one very specific thing. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to talk about that when I talk about that thing. Uh, or at least I'll, I'll try to. External transitions, yeah, same thing. Transient transitions are another word for um, always transitions. So in fact, they're, they're exactly the same. It's just an old syntax. Now, forbidden transitions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I know what that's about. Oh yeah, multiple targets. This is useful. Um, multiple targets is useful for when you have a, a parallel state and you want to say, okay, this is a really good example. When you have um, like a mode and a status here, this is quite abstract. Um, when you deactivate, what you're gonna do is within both of those, you're going to go to the mode.inactive and go to the status.disabled targets. So it's like you're you're sending out two waves at once, which can be useful in some situations, but it's kind of like a power uh, like a power user thing, really. So wildcard descriptors, we talked about that. Yeah, there we go. If else transitions, guided transitions. Okay, transitions over. Hierarchical state nodes. I think we've mostly done this. Uh, I'm going to get a drink of water. Yeah, I'll have a quick flick through this page to see if there's anything we haven't covered. Initial states we covered. Events we've covered. Um, yeah, uh, one thing to note that's quite useful here is if you have a, um, let's go back to our um, machines, wherever they came from, machine here. Um, if you have a state, let's just sort of uh, use this one here. So open the visual editor. And we have like this event here called falls asleep. Now falls asleep, um, what it's going to do is it's going to, uh, if you have two instances of falls asleep, um, or even, yeah, we do have a loud noise there too. 
let's imagine that, um, and let me think of, a, of an example that's not abstract. I, I am actually gonna go abstract for this. So we're gonna have a couple of states in here, uh, not you, uh, we're gonna have one here. And we're gonna have an event which is called foo, and another event which is called bar. And foo and bar are just gonna to toggle between. So we've got bar here. And if we simulate, then foo goes here, bar goes here, foo goes here. Now, when we have a, um, let's imagine that there's an event where we have a bar that comes from the top and goes to new state two here, so bar. Now this bar here, what it's gonna do is when we, if I click this, and we go to this state foo here, when I press bar, what do you think is gonna happen? Because one arrow is going here and one arrow is going there. Let's see. We go to there. That's because the one that's kind of closer into the state node, that's more relevant to the state that you're in, that's what will end up happening. So you can have a bar here, and actually, weirdly now, it toggles. So when we're in the new state one, uh, over here, and we click bar, then we go here because that's where the arrow is. But when we're in this state, then this listener now activates, and so we'll go here. So this one is the relevant journey that we're taking. So this is useful for when you like have sort of global listeners for things, like a sort of shift key or something, and when you want to react to them differently in certain states. So that's the behavior there. So, okay, we've got parallel state nodes, which I think we've covered. Yeah, 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 final states, which we've covered, and effects. Okay, so this is, we've started now talking about, um, we've done kind of actions, but we now need to start talking about, um, let's see, activities. Okay, so activities you can ignore completely, but somewhere else here, they're, yeah, invoking services. So, for this, I'm going to go back to something that I talked about up here, which is checking the permissions level. Now, what this is going to do is we've got checking permissions level and we've got this event called permissions details received. And that's quite abstract because it's not really doing anything. You know, it's just like if we had to do this in our UI, we would have to send an event of permissions details received from outside the state machine in. Whereas a better idea is to sort of manage that within the state machine. So when you have things that you want to run that are kind of like async, for instance, you usually want to run them inside the state machine because it's a really powerful way to control them. You know, what the way that we do that is through uh, an invocation or an invoke, and you invoke a service. So this is quite abstract, but what an invoked service means is it means that you're basically running a process where you're waiting for it to complete before you do something else. And the way that works is you can go inside here, and this is checking user permissions level. I'm gonna use the API here, and we're gonna go invoke source, uh, check user permissions. And I'll just use sentence case here, permissions. And there we go, now we've got this invocation here called check user permissions. And here now, I'm gonna open up this tab, and we can listen for when that invocation is complete say invocation.done. And now it's going to say when we're done with checking the user permissions, now based on what we receive, we can do different things. So we can, if the user is an admin, then we get admin, blah, 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 and you're used to this stuff. So that what that looks like is we've got this invoke source here, and then we've got this on done when it's complete. The other thing we can add here is what if our user permissions check errors? Ooh, that's pretty bad. What we're gonna do for that is we're gonna click and drag down here. And as you can see, it automatically gave you user permissions there. And if it errors, then it goes to the no permission. So on error there. And of course, these on errors, on dumbs, they're, they're just um, uh, events and transitions just like any other. So you can add actions to them. You can say uh, whale in terror when you um, go on done. And you can add guards to them too. So you can say if, uh, error is um, a timeout error, for instance. So if the error is a timeout error, probably won't want to go to the timed out state. And we can retry, we can even go back to the invocation from the same way. So if the error is a timeout error, we don't uh, definitely don't want to wail in terror. And we can click and drag this over there. Else, um, 
we can go to the no permission state. So that one there, go to no permission. And there, just for completeness, uh, we can go retry there. It's funny how error handling in xState becomes like a kind of really uh, trivial thing to do because you're just sort of like, you can see the flow so easily. So if we error there, we've timed out, else we've got no permission, you get the idea. So that's invocations. Now, when we go to sort of power up our invocations, when we go to implement them, we can implement them in this kind of clever way. We can go into services here. So we can say services, uh, check user permissions, and we can implement them as a promise here. So we can say, okay, yeah, we've got user permissions admin. And now, uh, that's really nice. Thank you, GitHub. Uh, we can also um, type these strongly too. So we're gonna go inside uh, our create machine call and we're gonna pass in schema. And schema is gonna be an as here. You can ignore this if you're not using TypeScript, by the way, but it's pretty useful. Uh, we can say services and our service is check user permissions. And the data from that service is, it is like a user and then permissions is a string array. And now if we pass anything that's not that, it's gonna error on us. It's gonna say uh, permissions is missing and blah, 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 blah. We can even then inside our guards, because we've got some guards here that we need to implement as well. We need to check if the user is an admin. So there we're gonna to need to check our context and our event. And on the event, we can see that we have access to the data that was passed there. So we can return event.data.user.permissions.includes admin. Uh, same is true for the others. Uh, user is normal. And in fact, it might even, GitHub Copilot might be nice here. Yes, it does. Uh, and there we go. So we've now implemented a service that when we enter this state, what it's gonna do is it's gonna go through these checks and um, and see it all working. So let's see that working in our um, in our application that we've made too. Two seconds. I've just implemented it here, but I've noticed that I've got an error because I, I've added some sort of silly actions here so I, and that I don't really want to implement. So I'm gonna go back into here and remove them from this little array there. When I save that, it changes that there. And we've got our app and that error should go away momentarily. I think if I save this, Event data. Aha, two seconds, I'm just gonna fix something. Okay, and now we also need to implement the error is timeout error here, and we're just gonna return false here. Uh, now, when we go into our UI, you should see that we're checking the user permissions level, and that, that went by pretty fast, so I'm gonna change that to a two second thing. Uh, timeout resolve, maybe three seconds, oops. And now when we do this, you can see we're checking the user permissions level, and then it goes to admin because it actually ran that service and then it resolved to permissions admin. So if I change this to permissions normal, then again, it checks the user permissions level and bam, it goes into normal. So this is great for when you've got async things to run, like when you're calling an API, for instance, you can use this pattern and it works really, really well. So invoking services then, um, we've covered source, we've covered on done, we've covered on error. Mm. I'm gonna skip over invoke.ids. This is useful for when you can invoke different things other than promises. You can see that promises are sort of uh, just here front and center, but you can also invoke uh, callback functions here. Invoking callback functions, I've actually got an article about this, which you can read uh, on dev.2, uh, which is like uh, invoking callbacks, x state. Uh, why I love invoke callbacks. Um, the reason I love them is that you can, they're super, super flexible and they're kind of like effects in React. And what they do is you, when you first initiate the function here, you can say context event um, and you have access to the context and event as they were at that time. You can then also send events back to the machine just from the service itself. So a great example of that is if we go to XState Catalog, we can look at the tab focus machine. Now the tab focus machine is it's implemented down here. And you can see that it's like a, a function which returns a function and this send is just here. And what it's doing is it adds an event listener. And if we 
add the event there, it sort of sends report tab blur. And what that does is when we're in the tab blur state, it goes to the uh, user is not on tab state. And there we um, sync, uh, invoke another service, which is check for document focus. And check for document focus, what it does is it does the opposite thing. It checks for when they've focused and it reports that the user has focused. So it means that you can start off a process and then run a cleanup on that process uh, when we leave the state. So invocations are only run while you're in that state. And a question that we get a lot as well is how do I like cancel a promise uh, as I'm going? So the way I would do that is you can say, uh, let's say we have a canceled state here. When we're invoking the service on the checking user permissions level, we just add an event where we say cancel. Cancel. Uh, cancel. And now if we go to our UI, what's going to happen is when we cancel this, is it's going to um, basically, yeah, I can press cancel and it goes to the canceled state. So we never end up in this admin normal or no permissions mode. You can see that we're sort of waiting for this invocation to be done and we can either go in one of these three ways or we can cancel and it's over. So that's a really, really common, simple thing that you can do with xState. Um, so invoking services, listen for parent events, observables, I've never used this. Um, not sure how important it is. And invoking machines, uh, I haven't used this. Well, I've used this a bit. Um, you can do similar things to when you've uh, done the machine so you can listen for on done, um, all that sort of thing. There's one thing that we haven't talked about so far actually, which is the after. The after is a fascinating little bit of code. Um, what it does is it allows you to specify timeouts kind of really declaratively in your machine. And timeouts here, what they're going to do is, for instance, let's imagine that um, we've got our dog back here. And the dog, what it's going to do is when it's asleep, unfortunately, this this uh, the dog, like, it's got a bit of a sleeping issue and it can only sleep for like 10 seconds at a time. So we're going to add a transition from asleep to awake. And this transition is going to be an after transition. So I'm going to just make this a little bit bigger so we can see this panel here. I'll click on this event and we'll say after and the delay is going to be 10,000 milliseconds. So after that amount of time has passed, we're going to go into the awake state. When we simulate this, uh, we're in awake, so it falls asleep, falls asleep, falls asleep. Ah, for some reason, the after events aren't working terribly well here. But the idea here is that you would have this after 10,000 10, milliseconds target dog awake. I'm just going to report this bug. So we can use this when we... Um, in our uh, machine here. So let's say that we have this, uh, not the counter machine, the authentication machine. So what we're gonna do is we're, when we're in this invocation here, after a certain amount of time, we're going to time out this request because we're just gonna ignore it. We're, let's imagine that we say uh, it's gonna be after one second, 1,500 um, milliseconds, we're gonna go into the timed out state. And the way that works is when we go to our UI, we can see that we have blah, 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 and we go to timed out because our invocation is also using kind of this dummy set timeout, but it's resolving at 3000 instead of like, uh, if we were to choose 1200, that's less than the after. So it's actually gonna work now where we say refresh and we go to normal because that's uh, it's not timed out. It's managed to succeed its request. So the afters are useful for all sorts of things. You can make like loading indicators out of them, like timers out, like it's just an amazing way to express set timeouts in the XState sort of API. And it's really, really declarative and easy to use. So there's the after there. Um, we can invoke with context, done data, sending events, sending responses. Yeah, you can invoke multiple services on the same, um, uh, same node if you want to on the same state that's sometimes useful and testing blah, 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 referencing services okay cool um, now actors I'm actually not going to go into on this uh, speed run I might do this in a future speed run kind of like going through the advanced bits of X state but for everything that we've got going on now like we've already got a whole buttload of information to, to go through 
and actors are very advanced uh, part of the API and sort of uh, and useful, but I find myself using them less than the core parts of the API. So I'm not going to go into actors too much as they are now. We've got interpreting machines. Yeah, okay, so we've got the interpreter, uh, sending events, transitions, starting and stopping the interpreter too is useful. Uh, using TypeScript. So using TypeScript, I've covered it a little bit, which is where we've got the, um, I'm using the VS Code extension and we're using TypeGen. And TypeGen basically works by sort of working off these contexts and events types here. And I'm gonna pass these into our, let's say we've got a, uh, I'm gonna just find an example. Okay, I'm gonna use our count example that we talked about earlier. Now, what I'm gonna do is when you uh, toggle, you can actually attach a, let's say um, we give it an increment event instead. And we have an increment here too. And every time we increment, we're gonna to toggle between on and off. It's a slightly strange uh, setup. And actually let's uh, remove these entry and exit events. And actually as a, um, as a way of doing this, we're actually gonna remove the off state entirely. And we're just gonna have an enabled and disabled state. So I'm gonna do this differently. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep this always here, and I'm gonna add a little line here and make a self transition, and I'm gonna say increment um, uh, count. And when we increment this count, we're going to add an action. So we're gonna have an action, which is gonna be increment count by number, uh, or by event value. Because we're not going to increment it by one, we're actually going to pass an increment to the increment count event. The way we can do that is by using schema. And schema allows us to pass events, which is going to be this as type increment count. And the count is going to be a number that we pass. So count number. And what this is going to do is we don't need our increment toggle anymore but we will need our increment count by event value. And assign now, uh, context event, I'm gonna use this syntax now. Uh, just pull this, make it a bit bigger. We're going to return, uh, the count is gonna be context.count plus the event.count. And event.count is there because we've declared the event as increment count. So we know that only the increment count event can cause this increment count by event value. And so the count is gonna be present on that event. And I'm gonna add a little button into our UI here, which is gonna add or increment the count by five every time, or maybe two or something, don't know. Okay, we've got our button here. And what it's gonna do is it's going to send an event where it's going to be of type increment count. And the count is going to be what we've passed in. So, oh, in fact, we're still using our authentication machine, which is why this is being funny. So we should use our counter machine instead. Don't need that guard anymore. And now we've got an error because we haven't passed count. So we're gonna say the count is two. And now when we go to our UI, you should see that we have an increment two and it's being added because we're passing it to there so increment two increment six and you get the idea i'm gonna finish up i think this sort of little speed run here now um i think we've covered everything we need to in terms of you can you can also strongly attack the context as well and i might do this again but i look forward to to seeing you for the next one this was fun